Welcome back, Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. Really pleased to have with me once again, Charles Hugh Smith. It's been a while since Charles has been on with us, uh, regrettably so, because he puts out, every week he puts out, it seems like an awful lot of, of very, um, very easy to read, easy to understand, but very important essays. Um, and uh, you can pick those things up uh, on his site, it's, um, if I have it here. Uh, anyway, let me just get it through his uh, through his bio here. Bio. Um, he is the author and proprietor. Okay, here we go. Of two minds dot com. That's where you can go. Uh, he started publishing it in uh, 2005. So, uh, and he's the author of uh, numerous books, including the latest uh, that was just out last month: Global Crisis, National Renewal, A Revolutionary Grand Strategy for the United States. Uh, and I hope that we can talk to him a little bit about, or he can talk to us a little bit about that book, because I think it's, I do have a copy of it, but just got it and haven't had the time to look at it as thoroughly as I would have liked to. So uh, I'm hoping he can give me a bit of a teaser to stimulate me to spend uh, some some uh, quality time in the book. Thank you for uh, joining us again, Charles. Well, Jay, it's always my pleasure, and um, i, I I know that your readers and um, and listeners are always um, attuned to understanding the fundamentals beneath the noise and the, and mm-hmm. the surface. Mm-hmm. That's what we try to do, of course, and I know that you do that as well as anybody. Um, so we'd like to have sort of one of your more recent, I think this is November 29th, Why Inflation is a Runaway Freight Train. Of course, today I think we saw a new, new higher PPI numbers, the highest we've seen, I don't know, since I was a young person back in the 70s. Uh, how do, first of all, I'd like to ask, how do you define inflation? Because I know there seems to be different definitions of it. Most people think of inflation as simply the CPI, uh, which is, uh, as you point out very well in your essay, uh, you know, not, not very well understood. And, of course, I think probably a government can play games uh, with how they do the numbers and so forth. But the Austrian School of Economics, they define it simply, inflation simply as the uh, uh, money creation. And, you know, the more money you print, the higher your inflation is. And they maintain that we've had an, a massive amount of inflation over the last number of decades in the financial markets with stocks and bonds, you know, going to levels that make seem no, seem to be completely detached from reality these days. Uh, but what is your definition of inflation? Well, that's a great starting point, Jay. And um, my definition is um, more about purchasing power uh, mm-hmm. of, of your wages, like your, your earnings. Sure. What, what can you buy in terms of goods and services? And so um, if you're buying, if, if the cost of what you're buying has gone up, but you're getting the same quality and quantity or mm-hmm. less, Mm-hmm. That's inflation. And, of course, that's what we see. And we see it in, in so-called shrinkflation, right, where the, the package of cornflakes is now like five ounces less or the candy bar is now a half ounce less. And yet it, the cost is the same. So we're getting less for our money. And, of course, you and I being old enough to remember what how this works in the 70s is your, your wages never seem to keep up. And that's that's the danger with inflation is inflation can run away from you. And so you get a five percent raise and you think, well, I'm doing OK. But if inflation's at 10 percent, you're still losing ground. And I think that's where we are now, where mm-hmm. we're, everybody's losing ground, except those people who are riding these um, asset bubbles you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the Austrian definition, it certainly explains I think explains much of why we have this redistribution of wealth to a very small number of people because for decades this has been going on. The people closest to the feeding trough are the ones that seem to do the best, those that are somehow attached to the military-industrial complex, which in, or the, all those government programs, um, and you know they're funded with money created out of thin air. And it hasn't been a problem to such a great extent until just recently um, but I'd like to, you know, before we explore the reasons for that, maybe I'd like to just get into your essay a little bit. Uh, you stated there what's missing uh, in most of these debates between those who think that deflation is a problem and those that think that inflation is what we need to be paying attention to. You said what's missing 
in most of those inflation deflation debates is a comparison of scale. Could you comment on that? Yeah, and what I mean is um, at the household level, um, if if your rent or property taxes go up by a few thousand dollars a year, um, that's uh, logged in the in the consumer price index as a very modest amount, right? It's like, oh well, that that went up, uh, you know, two two percent, but but the <laughs> amount of money was large. Uh-huh. Where then they say, oh, the price of jeans imported from Pakistan dropped twenty percent. Wow, that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Now, you only buy a couple pair of, of blue jeans a year or whatever. So let's say that's $100. So you've now that costs 80 Okay, I've saved 20 bucks. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, my other costs have gone up by $2,000, $3,000, and $1,500. Mm-hmm. You know, child care, health care, rent, property taxes, those things go up by thousands. And yet the savings that are supposed to offset all that are a few hundred bucks. Yeah, the blue jeans got cheaper, the TV got cheaper by a few hundred bucks, but those aren't essentials. I don't buy those every every week. Everything that I have to pay has gone up by leaps and bounds. And so that scale is what's uh, missing from all these calculations. So we're seeing inflation, we're seeing numbers, and I agree that it seems to be, at least from what we hear, uh, the statistics is that the wages are not keeping up. Uh, I know wage inflation is... The first time that I can remember since the 70s, it's been a real big problem. Uh, but, you know, supply and demand, of course, are always the dynamics that determine price. Uh, scarcity seems to be a main driver of prices, rising prices now. Scarcity of goods, uh, what are some of the factors that are leading to such a scarcity of goods now? Uh, and what are the prospects of the global economy overcoming them? Well, that's a great question, Jay, and and I think we I think the key thing that we we need to focus on that that gets lost in the shuffle is how dependent America has become on resources and goods from overseas. So that means we're dependent, and in many cases, entirely dependent on these long supply chains, which are fragile due to their length and the number of intermediaries involved, and all these other issues like um, once you give that power and control to foreign nations, well, then you've given them the opportunity to blackmail you or raise prices. And there's, um, since you've now become dependent on them for uh, as the primary source of these goods, well, then they can raise prices and we can't do anything about it because we've shipped our supply chain overseas. And so that dependency is a, is a real uh, source of of higher prices and um, the fragility of this long supply chain is also a problem because as I mentioned everybody along that long supply chain has to still make money if they don't make money they go out of business mm-hmm. and and so you know everybody wants somebody else to absorb the costs uh, of, you know the higher costs of shipping and production and labor and it's all like <laughs> at some point somebody has to has to pay everybody in that long supply chain and there can be dozens of different companies right and in like any kind of electronic device or manufactured uh, good and and everybody there has to make money and if they can't make money then they'll just close their doors and then you've got a supply disruption we certainly we're certainly seeing that and of course they've been exacerbated by uh, by the pandemic uh, by the covid issues um, and um, but yeah, we so we've made ourselves dependent on, on China. I guess it worked very well for a while, didn't it? We got rid of our high priced labor. Um, the middle America that was doing relatively well when I was young are, are now, you know, um, having tremendous problems of all kinds um, uh, opiate deaths and you know, drug addiction, all kinds of issues and unemployment and hopelessness. It seems to be so much a part of the uh, Midwestern landscape in many ways these days. Uh, So we're also, though, and that contributes to another problem, though. All these issues, these health issues and so forth, uh, to the labor issue, um, you know, in your November 29th article, you talked about the scarcity of labor that is pushing labor inflation higher and you noted at least five factors that you believe suggest that rising labor costs are here to stay at least for a while. Could you talk about those? Yeah, and um, I'm. It's, this is such a fascinating topic, Jay, because those of us who've been around a few decades 
um, you know, we remember when labor had more power, and you know, mm-hmm. you can kind of yeah. you can kind of talk about the balance of power between labor and capital, right? Mm-hmm. The, the owners of capital and, and and the people who have to work for a living. Mm-hmm. And I I think that there's a lot of academic studies out there. Like I've I've posted one from the Rand Corporation that that it's clear that capital had the upper hand for the last 45 mm-hmm. years. You know, mm-hmm. the the end of sound money, right? 1971, mm-hmm. and, and High inflation, the first oil shock, all those things occurred in the early 70s. And and all the power kind of went to capital. And so mm-hmm. they all the gains of productivity in, a, in our society, most of those gains went to those, the owners of capital. And, um, and of course, if you, you as you say, the, you create money and debt out of thin air, mm-hmm. that, benef- that benefits those who already have the capital, too. So wages have, have really not kept up. They've stagnated since um, the, the mid-70s. And so now we're starting to see that the scarcity of labor is, is generating um, a little change in that power structure. And, and the reason why is if you can't find the people to do the work, you've got to pay them more money. And as I said, this is pricing on the margin, meaning that if you have, you've been paying your employees eight fifty an hour and the only way that you can retain them is to pay 12 an hour, you, mm-hmm. have, you can't just you can't just pay your new the first that higher wage to the first two you got to pay it to the other hundred because they're going to find out real quick (laughs) and so then you get wage um so-called wage price uh a spiral but i I think that this is what's missing from most people looking at this is wages have been suppressed for decades and so Mm -hmm. playing playing catch-up is kind of like what's happening but it's surprising everybody because everyone was used to people just accepting wages that weren't really uh, a living wage and um just real quickly, one of these, this is the problem with social mobility. When you and I started out, we could earn a kind of low wage and still look forward to eventually being able to buy a small house somewhere. Uh-huh. Well, that's no longer possible. So this whole dilution of money and, and favoring um, the wealthy and uh, those closest to the central bank money spigot, this has created huge inequality and and people are starting to awaken to this and saying, well, I, I, I need more money just to be able to pay these higher costs. So mm-hmm. that's an element. And another one is the health issue you talk about. Now, we can talk about the effects of long COVID. We don't know what they are, but we do know statistically the number of people uh, who are dis, uh, disabled or claiming dis, uh, disability has soared, you know, from a couple percent of the population to like, I think it's 9% or something of the working population is no longer in the workforce. And so, um, and baby boomers are retiring. A lot of them woke up in COVID and said, why am I working? I'll just go ahead and retire. So there's a lot of different elements to why there's a scarcity of labor. And one last element is people have decided, I think I'm going to favor my family instead of my job. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that's a cost as well. Uh, when uh, when parents uh, are not spending quality time with their children and with with each other, uh, it has results that aren't positive as well. A lot of times, so I guess balancing it out. And uh, if, if you know, if you're working extremely hard and going nowhere, uh, you don't see the hope of of your hard labor gaining anything materially. Then sometimes it might be actually might be beneficiary in many ways to. Uh, sort of settle down and and pay some quality time and with your with your loved ones for sure. So I guess those are decisions that people are making. Uh, but it seems to me that what we just did as a country though was uh, we took advantage or at least capital took advantage of low wages overseas. Uh, we got rid of the the higher paying jobs. We broke the back of the union essentially the unions that were so powerful in the seventies yet sixties and seventies. And and then I, I've always believed that uh, owning the world's reserve currency also required us to make sure that we were uh, that we were running deficits, trade deficits all the time. So that way, there was enough money to flow around the globe that we could have the world's reserve currency and the uh, uh, you know and, and and the liquidity and the depth that is required of the world's reserve currency. But uh, all right, so. These are things, though, so we have a shortage of, of labor, we have a shortage of goods, and and yet um, we keep printing money. The Fed keeps printing money, I guess. Um, I mean, what 
what do you think the prospects are of allowing interest rates to return to whatever the market rates, <laughs> what the markets would require? Uh, you know, if we went back to sort of a free market system that, that priced money based on supply and demand, and we didn't keep increasing the supply by printing more money, the Fed, uh, what, how would that shake out? Well, that's a great, uh, great question, Jay, and I think that's really the question of our era is, is do, we, do we let markets uh, discover price and, um, or do we just keep sort of manipulating the system to create like phantom wealth for the mm -hmm. few at the expense mm -hmm. of the many? And I think what, what you um, and your, many of your guests focus on and what I focus on too is what's the source of stability? In other words, what, can, what makes a system – uh, robust, uh, resilient, um, adaptable. Well, it, it's basically market forces, transparency, competition, accountability, all the things right. that have been lost or eroded in America. So when you just make a, a conjure trick about, you know, you're conjuring money out of thin air and creating these kind of financial tricks to keep the illusion of, of stability, you're actually undermining and eroding the sources of stability. And so then you get this unstable system, which is what we have now, where the Fed has to print even more trillions because the whole thing is so shaky, right? Because there's no real price discovery and risk isn't priced at all. And so what would happen if we went back to even five or six percent interest rates? You know, you and I remember when a home mortgage was 10, 11 or 12 percent. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that would break the government, right? Because the government can only borrow and, and pay interest on $25 trillion in debt at 1% or 2%. Once it's 5%, then the government, virtually all the tax revenues just go to pay interest. So um, I don't see how that – I think we've lost the opportunity that, that we had, say, 20 years ago to write the system. So now we're facing um, some really uh, difficult – kind of adjustments back to a, a, a system that has dynamic stability, you know, that that's what you get with the market and transparency and accountability So, and competition. So to, we need to get there. And it's like, can we get there without declaring national insolvency? I, I think that's an open question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hope so. But mm -hmm. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather take the shock and let the asset bubbles deflate because mm -hmm. they're going to they're pop anyway. So... Mm -hmm. We might as well get it over with, and then we can move on to a, a more stable future with, as you've often said, a, a sound money system. Mm -hmm. Well, if, we ha if the asset prices deflate, uh, would we still have inflation? Because, you know, your, your premise is that we're, inflation is a runaway freight train. Right. Well, it's going to I think we would still have inflation as long yeah. as we're de dependent on foreign sources for resources mm -hmm. and goods because they, mm -hmm. they, we've ceded control to them. So n even if we had a recession, it doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly have uh, lower prices because those um, those suppliers uh, define um, the price, you know, and so we're going to have to reshore our entire production and supply chain in order to gain, regain control of supply. Um, geez, my engineer is telling me I only have three minutes left, and I wanted to ask about your book. I wanted to have you talk about it. Uh, what, Real quickly, what do the deflationists get wrong? What are they failing uh, to see? I, I think they're failing to see that um, the, the, the national dependency that we've uh, created on, on, on outside sources for supplies, and, and they're, they're confusing um, deflation of assets with with deflation of prices of essentials, so you can get an asset deflation, um, but but that doesn't mean that gasoline is going to get cheaper because that's um, that's a natural resource, and so there's a lot of other factors that that don't have anything to do with how much money the central bank is printing. Uh, all right, your book, Global Crisis National Renewal, uh, a revolutionary grand strategy for the United States. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, it's uh, to me, it's. I think I need to, to read this book and then have you back and, and discuss several very important aspects of it. But just give us a an overview of it with two minutes left here. About great. Well, I think the um, what academic studies and history have found is that there's two things that bring down nations and empires. You know, extreme inequality and scarcity of essentials. Those are the two things that break countries, right? Because if you can't afford bread or rice, 
then you, you're you're um, you're going to get desperate. And if soaring inequality means all the wealth and power are held by a handful of people, that's also not uh, that's just not a, uh, a recipe for stability. So the U.S. has both of these issues. We we have the most extreme. Uh, wealth inequality and power inequality in our history, in, in my view, and we're dealing with global scarcities now. You know, we've be, we've globalized, and so now we're exposed to global scarcity. So we need to like focus on restoring um, stability and balance in the United States by by dealing directly with this vast inequality and with these scarcities of essentials. We have to start um, producing more ourselves and sharing the wealth much more broadly than we have for the past 20 years. And that, I think, will require revolutionary change. Not not overthrowing the government, but simply change that's much more dramatic than what people have been accustomed to. I guess maybe that's why you put the word revolutionary uh, in parentheses in your, in your title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 what I'm looking forward to is a duly elected government that, uh-huh. that, takes, that, that starts taking back the country from... Um, pr- parasitic elites. <laughs> I would, I would, I would say amen to that. Uh, we'll have to leave it go at that, Charles. But I want to have you back sometime soon to talk more in depth about your book because I think it's a must-read and very, very important uh, things to say there. So thanks so much for being with us, and we'll look to do it again sometime soon. Thank you, Jay. Okay.